Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. This is Rabia Mahmood and welcome back to lecture number 25. Today we are going to start from the same point where we left in our uh, previous lecture. We were discussing actually the concept of register and before that we have also looked at different varieties of English that are existing. Uh, we have uh, looked at in detail analysis of different varieties of English language uh, that uh, were there uh, for and, uh, and the one of the variety is uh, dialect. The other is the, we, we were we were we have looked at the concept of language as well. Uh, then we discussed uh, sociolects, idiolects, and then we came to the concept of register. Yes. Um, in in register we said that uh, the focus from the uh, from the users has shifted to the use to the language use. Uh, th th actually, th uh, we define register as uh, the language according to the use. Yes. Um, who, uh, for example, uh, it is like the formality scales, uh, formality scales, and the very formal frozen or the rigid is there. Whereas uh, uh, there is some uh, form, neutral, informal, formal styles, and the neutral style, and the informal style, and the very informal, casual, and the familiar style. These are the two. Actually, while we talk about the usage, we are saying that there is a long continuum of the two thing that is existing uh, of the style. On one hand, we had very, very, uh, we had on one hand very, very informal style. We'll have informal. On the other hand, we can have formal style of communication of the language use. Formal is sometimes very very rigid a specific style whereas the informal is relaxed casual whereas within these uh, these things come different kind of things some neutral style some and uh, the, the things that come in between okay there's a person Jews who in 1961 he talked about the five styles in the spoken English uh, in 19 uh, he he said that there are the five styles of spoken English. The first one is the frozen. Printed unchanging language such as the Bible quotation often contains archaism. Yes, this is the frozen style of language. This, this is unchanging. This is printed unchanging language such as the Bible quotation often contains archaism. Archaism mean that is that contains outdated and the old language. The second style is the formal style one way participation and no interruption formal as uh, the decorum of we can say uh, a class is very very formal one where uh, a conversation is being delivered from one person who is higher in authority and to the other person who is less in the authority so it is one way participation and includes no interruption most of the time in formal for most of the time in formal conversation in formal language you will have some the use of technical vocabulary uh, technical vocabulary for example fussy semantics or exact definitions are very very important it includes introductions between strangers if there are the two strangers who are going to come close who are going to meet so uh, there are some introductions that are needed so the second style is that of formal style this, the third is uh, consultative, uh, consultative style. Consultative, that is about concerts, that's about uh, suggestions. The, it's the two-way participation. Formal was one way. One had authority, the other is a lesser authority. Consultative, with, uh, where there is a conversation going on between the two participants. Uh, between uh, the two uh, participants, background information is provided prior knowledge is not assumed some background uh, information would be there but prior knowledge is not assumed uh, no prior knowledge no knowledge beforehand knowledge is not assumed back channel behavior such as ooh, ooh, I see etc is common interruptions are allowed in consultatives 
because this is actually you know a consult is going on it's a specific style of conversation where somebody is consulting giving suggestions to others where someone might be giving advices to others so in this uh, advices the other person can come and they can ask for the uh, interruptions they can ask any of the questions so in this kind of style interruptions are allowed in casual in group friends and acquaintances uh, uh, would be uh, our style would be casual the peop the the friends or the people the acquaintances who are from our own group they are casual there's no background information provided in that ellipses and the slang uh, common uh, yes these are the two feature of casual conversation ellipses and the slang is common ellipses is about omission where a few uh, uh, words are omitted ellipses and slangs slangs are actually uh, a specific language we are going to discuss today in our uh, lecture that what are slangs they are common interruptions are common one person is speaking the other is interrupting one is saying something the other is saying some other thing the two are speaking at the same time so this is a casual style of speaking the th the last is intimate it's a non public style it is it is related to your very one very very close one who is intimate to, uh, to you intonation more important than wording or the grammar yes in this style your intonation the way you say it, let's say if you're talking to to a very intimate friend of yours uh, who is very very close friend of you your intonation is going to make a difference intonation is a rise and fall of language the way you are going to use your tone is the rise and fall of the language the way you are going to use your tone uh, your language you are going to say something so it is going to make a difference it's some private vocabulary would be there maybe the vocabulary between the two intimate friends is uh, a different one from uh, the public uh, environment from the that we share perhaps from others there is a certain vocabulary that we have for our private friends so the it is uh, intimacy is there in uh, this uh, styles the next concept uh perhaps we have also looked at this concept before this but a little recapitulation of isogloss uh greek isogloss is equal plus gloss uh, 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 and it is actually derived from the greek word isos and isos mean equal glossa means a tongue the geographical boundary the delineation of a certain linguistic feature the geographical boundary simply you can know in is as is known as isogloss example is the pronunciation of a vowel the meaning of a word or the use of some syntactic features a line uh, on a map enclosing an area with a particular linguistic feature is found is is known as isogloss various type of isoglosses are distinguished and uh, isophone is a feature of pronunciation isophone is a pronounced feature of pronunciation isolex is an item vocabulary and isomorph is a feature of word formation isoseem is a particular word meaning see there are various types of isoglosses that are distinguished these are the things that we have not dis discussed before there is isophone phone is from phoneme feature of pronunciation isolex isolex from the lexicon is a feature is a item of vocabulary isomorph is a feature of word formation and isoseem is a particular word meaning the isogloss separates rather than the connects points of equal language isogloss is going to separate the things it is a uh, separates the things rather than connects points of equal language yes this is uh, the dots uh, the lines that are drawn between uh, the nations these are isoglosses isoglosses on the four islands this these are the lines that are shown in different colors these are again isoglosses now some more varieties of uh, english language and uh, the two more important things 
that uh, we have not discussed just are the varieties of pigeon and creole pigeon and creole pigeon this word has been derived from chinese pronunciation of the business or from portuguese occupasso business and uh, pequeno small baby talk or habriu pigeon batter there are so many influences on this word pigeon it's a chinese pronunciation of the business pigeon it's from portuguese occupaco business and pequeno small baby talk or habriu pigeon batter yes it's a contact language that draws an element from two or more languages it's a see what is pigeon pigeon is a contact language what does it do it draws on elements from two or more languages it would draw on uh, elements it would call for the elements from two or the more languages a hybrid makeshift language used by and among traders on plantations with slaves and between europeans and indigenous people of asia africa americas 17 to 20th century see what it was the one feature it's a contact language the draws on elements from two or more languages what does it do it draws on elements from two or more languages it is not from one it has influences of two or more languages a hybrid makeshift language it's a hybrid it's a combination is a unique combination of hybrid makeshift languages used by and among traders they were used by whom and used among whom among the traders where on the plantations sometimes with the slaves and between europeans and indigenous peoples of asia africa and america in 17 to 20th century that language was known as pigeons it is often used pejoratively pigeon english childish corrupt lazy inferior over simplified simple minded extended pigeon latin pigeon marxism etc these are different words basic difference with the creole it is a learned language not a native one we are going to discuss the concept of creole as well later on but before that i just uh, give you one idea that this pigeon is a learned language people acquire it people learn this language it's not a native it will not be a local language of anybody rather people are going to learn it they are it is not their native it's a new language we develops in situations where speakers of different languages need to communicate but they don't share a common common language so it is very very mm, uh, evident from this definition that what this pigeon is it's a new language where there are different speakers that are available they have got everybody has got uh, or most of the speakers have got their own languages they don't know that the how to make a contact with each other so they are going to uh, share uh, some uh, language uh, their way of communication where they are going to share a common language where there would be they need to communicate but they don't share a common language the vocabulary of a pigeon comes mainly from one particular language and the vocabulary is the lexi fire an early pre pigeon is quite restricted in the use and variable in the structure it is uh, variable in the structure and it is restricted in the use why are we saying that it is restricted in the use and it is variable in the structure what is the reason why are we saying it an early pre pigeon is quite restricted in the use and variable in the structure we were discussing different characteristics of pigeons and we were saying that early pre pigeon is quite restricted in the use and variable in the structure it is it is restricted in the use why it has some specific usages it is restricted in its use in the sense that it it definitely has no other purpose rather than of 
a common conversation rather than to serve some personal common interest because it is a language that is a learned language it is not firstly the local it is not firstly the native language it is a learned language it is a learned language then the second is that it is learned only to talk among a specific group among that specific group where there is no common language found now what happens an early prevision is quite restricted in the use and variable in the structure it is definitely going to be variable in the structure there is not going to be some specific uh, structure of that uh, language uh, will not be there actually uh, yes uh, why why the structure will be variable because you know it is just for the sake of conversation just for the sake of communication just to fulfill a few needs that the people can interact with each other and everybody is using it on its own everybody is learning it on its own this is not a standardized variety uh, so uh, the structure is going to be variable one the later stable pigeon develops its own grammatical rules which are quite different from those of the lexifiers yes then later on there were some uh, pigeons uh, that are regarded as a stable pigeons they have developed their own grammatical rules they were quite different from those of the lexifiers once a stable pigeon has emerged it is generally learned as a school as a second language and used for communication among the people who speak different languages once a stable pigeon has emerged we are saying uh, when there are some grammatical rules that have developed and the stable pigeon has developed so what happens this stable pigeon it is uh, going to uh, make it uh, uh, it is uh, this stable pigeon is further going on and then it would make it uh an accepted language and it would become uh, it is generally learned as a second language and used for communication among the people who speak different languages it would be acquired it would be learned as a second language and it would be used as a second language and among the people who speak different languages for example nigerian pidgin and bislam are spoken in venu uh, venu uh, venuatu yes there is one specific pidgin uh that uh, actually has emerged out of the need of the people to communicate and to integrate with each other when uh, it has uh, it has come on it has uh, come up to the level of uh, let's say uh, to the level of some uh, settled point also when it has become a stable pigeon so it has developed its own grammatical patterns as well it has developed some grammatical rules as well so which these are quite different from those of the lexifiers and uh, it's uh, the people started acquiring it and people started uh, speaking it then features of a pigeon it has very very small vocabulary as i have already uh, said that it would have small vocabulary why the reason is that it is only actually emerging for the sake of interaction among the groups it has no other uh, it has no other purpose the main purpose is just an interaction a few hundred to the thousand words would be there it would no, it would have very very limited vocabulary because this is not the native language of anybody this is a learned language and the learned language for some restricted purpose for some restricted uh, um, uh, reason and so the reason is that uh, it has just uh, a few uh, vocabulary items only a few hundred and the thousand words whereas english has maybe a million and the million of words you can see the difference between a pigeon and an accepted uh, well expanded language it is mostly drawn from the superstrict language reduction of the grammatical features such as inflectional morphology there is uh, although we are agreeing that some grammatical rules can be there some grammatical features can be there but they uh, the, the grammatical rules are there but they are not that much expanded they are reduced 
uh, they have reduced grammatical features such as inflectional formology uh, and the example is given a talk pisin is a is a pigeon of the papua ne genoa this is a really really very famous pigeon and uh, you would see that how much uh, little vocabulary is there a few example is uh, are given there my come uh, is is just one this one thing this my come one phrase it is used for three things i come i'm coming i came whereas in english you know we have got so many structures so many rules to refer to the tenses this is my came okay one pillar house it refers to this word house two pillar house it refers to two houses this is the restricted vocabulary where there are no more inflectional morphology the grammar influenced by the substrate languages lack of grammatical complexity there is no redundancy for uh, no, no redundancy means the repetition of the thing is not there the focus of the so many things is not there for example english one man uh, with an english one man comes six men come singular and the plurals are marked in both noun and modifier and concord is shown in both noun and the verb yes if uh, we are using let's say uh, there is one there is one phrase one clause that is one man comes one man it comes and then second is six men come six men for while there is a plural noun the verb is come when there is singular pronoun it is comes singular and the plurals are marked in both the nouns and the modifiers and they concord with each other they have a, uh, an or they have a link uh, 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 that uh, connects them with each other tp when pull man i came skip a man i came this depends heavily on the context actually there are just a few of the words that are there uh, a few uh, limited uh, vocabulary items a few uh, limited uh, uh, rules of grammar are there and uh, they um, there is not a lot of uh, uh, morphology and as well as the syntactical structures are not there the expanded structures are not there restricted things are there so it makes up a pigeon english marks possessions for example in english it is john's house there is tp house building john for example english uh, from english belong shifts from uh, shifts from a verb to a preposition yes uh, in uh, while we were uh, in talk pisin we were looking at the example and this is house belong john in talk pisin that is a pigeon uh, it and the word belong as comes from english and uh, it has uh, the first come na uh, noun and then come belong and then comes uh, john again there is multifunctionality yes this is a very important feature of pidgin languages multifunctionality is there same word functions in many ways same words Uh, are going to function in different ways because there is there are no structures there are no vocabularies there are no grammatical rules so this they are uh, going to use the same structures the same words in different ways uh, for example in english ill adjective uh, there is one word in uh, that is ill and then in uh, that is an adjective illness is a noun in english for example but in talk pisin uh, there is uh, these two words my silk it means i am sick am i got am i got sick malaria i have malaria look how uh, restricted uh, structures and a very very limited vocabulary is there circum circumlocution circumlocution there is a uh, english branch uh, talk person ham belong divai han belonging to tree in talk person look at uh, the uh, words the only three words are uh, they are making a sense of the complete sentence creole creole 
लेटिन लेटिन वर्ड क्रियर इट मीनिंग्स टू बी गैट और क्रिएट द वर्ड क्रियोल एक्चुअली दिस इज दीज आर द टू मेन कॉन्सेप्ट इन इंग्लिश दीज टू कॉन्सेप्ट आर कमिंग एक्चुअली दीज आर द टू वेराइटीज ऑफ लैंग्वेज फर्स्टली वी हैव लुक एट फिजन्स एंड नाउ वी आर लुकिंग एट क्रियोल्स pigeons uh, we have seen up till now that pigeons are a variety um, uh, that is a learned variety that is spoken by the group of people for some mutual purpose for the purpose of understanding the things creole latin uh, it has uh, come from the word creer and meaning to beget or create okay Creole means to create. The term was coined in the 16th century during the great expansion in Europe, a European maritime power, and the trade and establishment of European colonies in America, as Africa, and along the coast of the South and the Southeast Asia, up to the Philippines, China, India, and in Oceania. This is actually a bit of the history that when this word was uh, coined. Uh, and what were the areas that were involved uh, for the uh, uh, development of creole originally therefore creole language meant the speech of those creole peoples creole peoples this was actually a, uh, a separate tribe and this was originally regarded as the language of those specific people of those specific uh, people who used to live uh, at some place creoles portuguese spanish and french colonies in the new world a noun from this word meant a person or animal born in the home this is a french creole caribbean usage in uh, 17 to 18 centuries and creole meant according to caribbean who has uh, actually used it in 17 to 18 century he said that it's a local descendant of european settlers who are the creoles creoles are the local descendant of european settlers they are the local descendants of european settlers uh, who were they there were the white creoles uh, and creole white the descendants of african slaves some another uh um, um and the creole uh, the, the people uh, the, the more creoles were coming they are the descendants of the african slaves the, so we can say that creoles is the language of the slaves it is coming actually from the slaves there there is negro creole and the creole negro it's a mixture of both it is usually capitalized the local creoles or the local creole population it is it is it was later on extended to louisiana it was not only confined to portuguese spanish and french colonies in the new world rather it was extended to louisiana later on later in the 19th century creole extended to the languages throughout colonial and post colonial tropics all over the world americas australias indian ocean as where well, it started it started getting extended and expanded french creole creole french was spoken in mauritius mauritius english creole creole english it was uh, seen in belize and jamaica uh ropa river creole it was uh, seen in uh, no, uh, evidenced in australia hawaii creole english it was uh, uh, it was noticed uh, around the regions of pacific oceans people of any background in a place where a creole is used are likely to speak whether or not it is their mother tongue yes a very very important feature of creole that we are uh, we have noticed that people of the first point the first thing to note is the people of any background the, they can be of any of the background in a place they they'll be living at one place with different backgrounds where a creole is used are likely to speak what 
whether or not it is their mother tongue they are going they would be speaking they will be utilizing this thing but whether or not it is their mother tongue so uh, if it is not their mother tongue even then it would be spoken and it would be used creoles are acquired as the first language by the children they are acquired by the as the first language by the children yes uh, the difference between so you have seen uh, the difference between uh, pidgin and creole they are being acquired as the first language uh, pidgin is never ever the first language creole is acquired sometimes as the first language by the children speech becomes faster vocabulary increases development of tense increases development of relative clauses increases look there is there is so much increase there is so much development that is going on regarding speech becomes faster speech the spoken component vocabulary the written component the tenses syntactical component development of rel relative clauses again the syntactical and the grammatical component of a language all these things are increasing in creole whereas in pidgin there was a restricted vocabulary that was never ever just keep one thing in your mind that pidgin is never ever the lang the first language that is learned as a second language whereas creole is the first language uh our uh, uh, it is uh, first language of the children yes uh it is a stable language that originates seemingly as a nativized pidgin yes it is a stable language yes Th whereas creole as pidgin is never ever a stable language it is a stable language that originates seeming seemingly as a nativized pidgin as a nativized pidgin mean as a localized pidgin it is uh, it is going to originate sometimes it is going to come up sometimes as a nativized pidgin well children start learning a pidgin as their first language and becomes the mother tongue of a community it is called called creole yes this is the ultimate process of creole uh, this is uh, what actually is regarded as creole when children start learning a pidgin as their first language you know we started discussing that pidgin is a language uh that is spoken by those group of people who do not have any other shared language so they needed one language to communicate okay fine the people started communicating by using the pigeons there are some pigeons that become stabilized when the pigeons become stabilized it means uh people uh, um, the next generations come they start speaking those pigeons and when the, the next generation comes and start speaking those uh, pigeons it means that it is now converting its status from being the second language to the first language of the uh, acquirer of the uh, children of that language when it becomes the first language it is uh, we are saying that it becomes the mother tongue of that community and it is called creole like a pigeon a creole is a distinct language which has taken most of its vocabulary from another language the lexifier but has its own unique grammatical rules look what are the differences uh, i'm not only elaborating one thing rather i am uh, explaining one concept with the cross referencing of the other like a pigeon a creole is a distinct language a creole is a distinct language which has taken most of its vocabulary from another language the lexifier it has taken its lang its vocabulary from the other from some other language and what is that that is the lexifier but has its own unique grammatical rules this is one addition to it 
वन एडिशन टू क्रियोल पिजन विल नॉट हैव इट्स ऑन यूनिक ग्रामेटिकल रूल्स विल नॉट हैव इट्स ऑन इंडिपेंडेंट स्ट्रक्चर दैट इज डिपेंडेंट ऑन समथिंग एल्स वेयर एज इट वुड हैव इट्स ऑन रूल्स ऑफ ग्रामेटिकल रूल्स इट वुड हैव इट्स ऑन विकेबलरी फॉर प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएटिंग फॉरनर स्टॉक्स there are the three people arends musk and smith in 1995 they suggest that the four different processes are involved in creating a foreign stocks accommodation imitation telegraphic condensation and conventions yes uh, how these uh, four processes are really important firstly the accommodation when people start accommodating at one place definitely they start interacting then comes the second process that is imitation they start accommodating they are residing at one place they are this they want some socialization they want some interaction and this the when they are uh, when there is uh, some uh, interaction that is going on so the process of imitation starts and then after imitation there comes the telegraphic condensation and uh, the the few things are condensed the, uh, there is a rise of some specific condensed vocabulary and then these vocabularies become the conventions and the norms and then they are acquired by the people now some characteristics of creoles presumably between 6 and 12 millions 12 millions people still using pidgin languages and between 10 and 17 using descendants from pidgins look what is the uh, characteristics of creoles creoles actually are uh, we are saying when uh, the pidgins are indigenized when they are localized when pidgins are learned as the first language by the people so it means they are becoming creoles and we obtain law we just see that between 6 and 12 million people they are still using pidgin languages and there are 10 to 17 uh, descendants of pidgins that we can trace even up till now and like a pidgin however a creole is not restricted in use and is like any other language in its full range of functions yes it has full range of functions a creole is not restricted in use as that of pidgin because the use why the use of pidgin language is rest restricted because it has got some specific functions there are not elaborated functions of language that we can identify if the functions are not identified if the functions are not elaborated definitely the use is also not elaborated creoles have certain grammatical similarities to each other and arguably not languages that they are derived from yes what does this point say creoles have certain grammatical similarities they would have certain grammatical similarities to each other and arguably not languages they that they are derived from they would have similarities gr some grammatical structures would be same they would have some uh, some other syntactical morpho syntactical similarities in them but we cannot say that creoles have their similarities from that specific language from it is derived creoles exhibit more internal variability than other languages it would exhibit more internal variability than other languages uh, more internal uh, variability than other languages definitely there is going to be um, lots and lots of variables than some other language why because it is coming from the pidgin the pidgin is a combination of so many of the varieties of language so many of varieties of language means there were so many uh, there were let's say if there was a group of 50 people who was living in one community out of these 50 there were 10 languages that were spoken among those 50 people 
and but the, those 50 people cannot communicate among each other out of those 10 languages because there was no even a single language that was common so out of those 10 languages uh, there emerged a new 11th language for the group of those 50 people that 11th language was known as pigeon now when it started getting stabilized when it became indigenized when people started learning it as their first language what happened actually it was learned and then it was passed on to, then it became a creole and now when it became creole creole definitely has variability because it is coming from the descendants of so many of the languages so many of the variable languages so it is going to show variability creoles are simpler than other languages they are not that much very much complex because they are not perhaps they are not that much developed as the other languages are creole languages have generally been regarded as degenerate or at best as rudimentary dialects of one of their parent languages they have been regarded as degenerate they have been degenerated they have uh, already been degenerated or at best as rudimentary dialects of their own parent languages creole has come to be used in opposition to language rather than a qualifier for it it is coming as a complete independent language rather than only a language that is only a qualifier or the modifier to us to to the mainstream of the language we can say it is because you know it is having vocabulary it is having a very um, we can say a very well developed uh, modernized uh, system of language uh, so uh, we can say that uh, creole is something more than only being a qualifier or an additional component of a language example gulla that is jamaican creole and hawaii uh, that is uh, creole english that is english creole uh, creole uh, so these are the two uh, are these are two separate creoles that are existing we cannot deny their importance we cannot say that they are nothing at all yes they are something in their own and they are something that are adding to the mainstream of the english language pigeons pigeons and creoles are the technical terms they are used by the linguists and not necessarily by the speakers of the language while uh, we are uh, giving some uh, comparison and contrast of the pigeons and creoles and we are saying they are the technical terms they are used by the linguists then they are not necessarily by the speakers of the language perhaps not uh, the speakers who are speaking a language they don't know that whether they are speaking a pigeon or whether they are speaking a creole actually these are the terms these are some of the terminologies that have been identified by the language experts for example speakers of jamaican creole call their language patwa and speaker of hawaii creole uh, english call theirs uh, pigeon yes it is not actually perhaps they are not aware of that what is happening to their language that what language are they using and what is uh, it or is it a pigeon or is it a creole actually it, this is all these are some of the created terminologies uh, these are some of the described uh, uh, conventions uh, some defined rules by the language experts by the li uh, by linguist to identify that this is language this is language this is dialect this is pigeon and this is creole there is to describe some creole phenomena there were actually the three uh, four uh, theories that were given to describe this phenomena the first theory uh, is known as monogenetic theory of pigeons and creole monogenetic look at the title the title is referring as mono single monogenetic coming from the single source a single origin genetic coming from the from mono single genetic genes 
uh, the pigeons and crows coming from the same genes. A single origin for these languages deriving them through uh, the lexification from a West African pigeon, Portuguese of the 17th century, and ultimately uh, from the lingua franca of the Mediterranean. They are saying that the, both the pigeons and crows have got their own same origins, they are coming from the same branch. Originally formulated by Hugo, uh, Hugo in the late 19th century and popularized in the late 1950s. These two concepts were actually, uh, they are not very, very uh, old concepts and these were introduced in the 19th century and they become more popular in 1950 and the early 1960s by Douglas Taylor. Second is European dialect origin hypothesis. Let's see what this theory says. The French Creoles are the foremost candidates to being the outcome of normal linguistic change. The French Creoles, while when they talk about these Creoles that are particular to the France, uh, they say they are the foremost candidates to being the outcome. They are foremost candidates to being the outcome of normal linguistic change. They are perhaps uh, the, the first ones who are going to be affected by the normal linguistic change, by the change that is happening. Creoleness, this European dialect region hypo hypothesis also defines creoleness. Creoleness to be socio-historic in nature and relative to their colonial origin, though, yes, what is creoleness? Creoleness is, is saying, actually creoleness is, you know, the process of, uh, the process of, uh, the lang the process that a language follow uh, to become a creole. Creoleness is to be socio-historic, it is socio-historic, it is related to society, it is related to the history in nature and relative to the colonial origin though, it is also relative to the colonial origin. What is the colonial origin? The colonial origin, the colonies that were made by some Britain. This is European dialect origin hypothesis that focuses more on the origin and that say that the creoleness is coming from the socio-historic in nature. It is, it is socio-historic in nature and it has got colonial origin uh, of itself. The third theory is a do the domestic origin hypothesis. The domestic origin hypothesis. It was proposed by Hancock in 1985 for the development of a local local form of English in the West Africa. Uh, let's see uh, that uh, what was uh, done. Towards the end of 16th century, English-speaking traders began to settle in the Gambia and Sierra Leone rivers, as well as in the neighboring areas such as Bulom and Sherbrooke coasts. There were different. Uh, that they started living over there. These settlers intermarried with the local population leading to mixed population and as a result of the, this intermarriage an English pigeon was created. See how English pigeon is created? These settlers intermarried. There were some settlers who started settling at some specific area and then, the, then what happened actually some interaction started between them and they started getting intermarried with the local population that was already uh, r uh, living there. Now what was the result of these intermarriages? Actually it, they had mixed populations, mixed population coming from different regions. They had this mix, mix, mixed populations and as a result of this intermarriage an English pigeon was created. Definitely now a mixed language came on uh, and this language was known as English pigeon which in turn was learned by the slaves in slave depots. Now the language that is rising, that is a pigeon that is rising, it was learned by whom? It was learned by the slaves who later on took it to the West Indies and formed one component of emerging English's Creoles. They, they took it to the West Indies and formed one component of the emerging English Creoles. Uh, they formed this uh, one component of all the uh, English's uh, Creoles, they made it one. Now foreigners talk or the baby talk that we, were, that we have previously talked about as well. A pigeon in the Creole language forms when native speakers attempt to simplify their language in order to address speakers who do not know their language at all. 
a pigeon in the crow language what does it do it is formed these are formed these are made when native speakers attempt when some local people when the local speakers of the local languages they try to simplify they are trying to uh, make their language understandable uh, and uh, make their language simplify in order to address speakers who do not know their language at all they actually start simplifying their language and what what is the basic purpose the actually the purpose of the simplification is that so that the other persons can get it they can have an idea that uh, what this language is uh, actually uh, to address the speakers that who do not know their language at all the simplification process refers to the people to the speakers who are interested in that language who want to know that language but they do not know so the, there is a process of sim, uh, simplification the language is simplified so that the other speakers can understand it because of the similarities found in this type of speech and the speech which is usually directed at the children so this was another uh, way of pointing out the creolization gradualist and developmental hypothesis another hypothesis let's see that what these hypotheses say that how these pigeons and creoles are made one class of the creoles might start as pigeons true and agreed one class of creoles we are saying that the creoles are uh, they come on the broader level uh, they are more accepted the one class of creoles they might start definitely they would have started as the pigeons because pigeons come downwards then comes creoles let me uh, make one hierarchy firstly there are the pigeons there are creoles creoles are referring to dialects these dialects are referring to languages or variety of languages and then these variety of languages there would be one standard language this is actually a hierarchy that goes on this is uh, a process of the, from uh, a very lower step how the things broaden up one class of the creoles might start as pigeons rudimentary second languages improvision for the use between speakers of two or more non intelligible native languages yes uh, perhaps they they might not be uh, intelligible they are not understandable native languages Keith Winom in Hems 1971 he says suggests that pigeons need three languages to form with one the the superstrate being clearly dominant over the others yes this is a new uh, addition uh, to our knowledge as uh, Keith is saying that pigeons need three languages three languages are needed to form what overall uh, means uh, the, uh, for the development process the three languages are needed when there are the three languages within three even they need to have one one that is a super straight language one that is more dominant one that is more powerful language to become clearly dominant over others the lexicons of a pigeon is usually small and drawn from the vocabularies of its speakers the lexicons of a pigeon is usually small yes we have we knew it the lexicons of the vocabulary is very very small and it is drawn from the vocabularies of its speakers it is only based on those uh, vocabulary items that are used by its speakers in varying proportions varying proportions mean it can be any number some uh, some uh, speakers may use uh, some uh, words uh, very frequently the others may not morphological details like word inflections which usually take years to learn are omitted the syntax is kept very simple usually based on the strict word order morphological details like word inflections 
which usually takes years to learn are omitted. There are no, although we are saying that uh, uh, Creole is a bit complex, but still it is not that much complex as that is a dialect or a language. It is a language in it, it's, it, is, it, is, it is complete in itself. Creole is complete. It has many things, but uh, very technicalities and the complexities of language are not there. In this initial stage, all aspects of the speech, syntax, lexicon and pronunciation tend to be quite variable, especially with regard to the speaker's background. The pro process of creolization that we have been talking about, that how a pigeon converts into creole, let's see what this uh, process is. Actually, creolization, in simple words, is a process of, uh, it's, it's a process when one pigeon converts and becomes a creole. If a pigeon manages to be learned by the children of a community as a native language and become fixed and acquire a more complex grammar with fixed phonology, syntax, morphology and syntactic, syntactic embedding. See how many things are there. What are the major differences between pigeons and creoles that you are noticing right now? If a pigeon manages to be learned by the children of community, it is learned by the children. Why the children? Why not the adults? Because they are the young learners, because they would be learning it as their first language. That's where the children, not the adults. The adults will be learning it as a second language or the third language, not the first. When uh, it is started learning by the children of the community as a native language, it, they are learning it as a native language, it becomes fixed. and acquire a more complex grammar. It acquires a more complex grammar with fixed phonology, sorry, with phonology. There is syntax, morphology, syntactic, embedding, everything is there. That is, that becomes Creole. Pigeons can become full languages in only a single generation. See what the important thing is? They become for languages only one single generation yes uh, uh, how because pigeons actually when uh, there is a lot of interaction when the next generation comes on up till then it has become a fully established language creolization is this second stage where the pigeon language develops into a fully developed native language Creolization is the second stage where the pidgin language develops into a fully developed native language. Yes, this is uh, the definition of creolization that is given here. It is the second stage where the pidgin language develops. It is developing into the fully developed native language. And the important word is native. Because it is being acquired by the children, it is becoming their first language. So it is, uh, it is, it is uh, turning to be developing, developing to be the native language. The vocabulary too will contain more and more words according to the rational and the stable system. Yes, uh, the vocabulary will have a lot of uh, exposure to the vocab uh, to the uh, to many things. It would have uh, added words and according to rational and stable system. Universalist approaches towards uh, creoles and pigeons. Universalist model stresses the intervention of specific gender processes during the transmission of language from generation to generation and from speaker to speaker. What does this stress? Is? This stresses the intervention of specific general processes. There are some specific general processes that are really used. Uh, for the transmission of the language from one generation to the other, uh, from one speaker to the other speaker. So the universalist approach would focus on the interventions of those rules, different specific rules. The process invoked varies. A, ge a general tendency towards semantic transparency, first language learning driven by the universal processes or the general processes of the discourse organization. Yes, the process involved in fact varies. The processes that are involved, they see they, what are they? There is a general tendency towards semantic transparency. 
what is semantic transparency the meanings the transparency of the meanings the understanding of the meanings of the same lang of the la language users first language learning yes language learning driven by the universal process or general process of discourse organization discourse organization we have said the discourse is simple words it is said to be uh, the communication it's a it's, it's a communicative aspect of language where you are studying uh, it's a general process of discourse organization where you are studying where you are going through the discourse where you are uh, looking at the discourse of uh, where you are going through uh the communicative aspect of the language discourse can be written discourse can be spoken so these are the general processes that are that are concerned with the three main areas one area is a meanings the other area is language learning and the third area is uh, uh the understanding or the organization of communication uh communicative uh, competence communicative uh, events Creoles are, are inventions of the children growing up on newly founded plantations. Around them, they they only had pigeons spoken, without enough structures to function as natural languages. Okay, the children use their own innate linguistic capacities to transform the pigeons' input into a full-fledged language. Yes, they are going to use it as to transfer into a full-fledged language. then the next uh, important terminology that we are going to uh, to look into the details of uh, into in our uh, today's lecture is that of the jargon jargon is a terminology that relates to the specific activity profession or a group simply jargon we can say jar jargon is a term terminology that we uses in different uh professions in different groups in different activities it develops as a kind of shorthand to quickly express ideas that are frequently discussed between members of a group yes let's say that we are i'm saying that i have some specific jargons among my colleagues i have got some specific vocabulary some terms terminologies that uh, we use only those terminologies and they understand the thing more precise of the specialized usage among practitioners of a field guild or insider jargons divorced from meanings to the outsiders they are uh, they are uh, divorced they are separate from the meanings to the outsiders then the usage of jargon they used in various fields for example sports broadcast uh the different all the professions have their own jargons The, uh, for example in sports broadcast they would uh, you know the what kind of terms they would use uh, for example uh, uh, like sixer like four uh, like uh, like out like uh, lbw these are different terminologies that are used in the sports uh, broadcast to refer to the concepts within the belief systems or organized religions yes while we talk about different religions while we are referring to certain things we are using some kind of jargons medical professionals can that definitely they would have their own jargons their own terminologies information technology with an internet nautical terms to refer to political strategies and tactics tactics uh, some political strategies would have their own uh, terminologies then comes slang slang is the use of informal words and expressions to describe an object or condition slangs are informal words that are used to refer to the object or some condition these are not formal informal used with very very close friends vocabulary that is meant to be interpreted quickly but not necessarily literally means we don't need a very detailed analysis of that word that is uh, a slang uh, we just can understand okay this word mean this thing then it's fine slang words or terms are often a metaphor or an allegory they are often a metaphor means they are uh, uh, sometimes uh, one word would be referring to something else or they are the allegory they uh, they would be they would be creating one word would be referring to some uh, other phenomena sometimes regional in that it is used only in a particular territory yes some slangs are used in some particular region P 
particular to a certain subculture uh, such as musicians and members of a minority groups definitely first uh, suppose that if there is a band of musicians they have got certain slangs they have got certain code language to talk to each other use of slang expressions can spread outside uh, their uh, original arenas to become commonly used some words eventually lose their status as slangs others continue to be considered as such by the most speakers the process tends to lead to the original users to replace the words with the others it is less organized terms to maintain group identity yes, sometimes to you are maintaining your group identity you are speaking some slangs just to within your specific uh, group of friends slang is the complete opposite of jargon it's yes exactly one thing to remember jargon is a formal terminology slang is the code word that you use with your close friends criteria for the true slang proposed by the dumas and lighter is that, that it is lowers temporarily the dignity of formal or the serious speech or writing or glaring misuse of the register it actually it it it, it is something that is derogative it is something that is negative some good connotations are not attached with this um with with the slangs okay slangs are something like negative words not good words that cannot be used in a formal setting usage uh, is it is familiar with whatever is referred to with a group of people uh, who are familiar to them uh, it's a taboo term in ordinary discourse with people of the higher social status with a greater responsibility you are not supposed to use it anywhere if you have got some slangs so definitely you cannot use them with some with in a group that is of social status it replaces a well known conventional synonym to avoid the dis uh, discomfort caused by the conventional item or elaborated slang terms are often known only within a clique or the in, or in group in a specific specific group uh, would be knowing the meanings of specific slangs to sum up uh, let's uh, come up uh, to the end of today's lecture with this uh, we have already uh, discussed so much in detail so we are coming uh, just uh, uh, towards the end and let me give you a quick recapitulation of what we have done today to sum up i would say that uh, b uh, today we have discussed pidgin languages and these are the languages are always used as a second languages whereas they develop when speakers of the different languages try to communicate often uh, uh, for the purposes of trade <clears throat> the lexicon usually comes from one language and the grammar from the other when these all these qualities are uh, stabilized and indigenized in one uh, language they become creole and cre we have after looking at the, the features of creole uh, we uh, then we came uh, towards um, different slangs towards uh, the terminology jargons that was th uh, those were two more varieties of language so uh, with this i'll just uh, wind up my today's lecture and uh, hopefully that you have really enjoyed uh, reading the varieties of uh, english language and hopefully that you have uh, got a clearer ideas about these different terms that i have used about the jargons that i have used today and uh, till the next lecture so take very good care care of yourself please keep reading and keep studying the things and uh, take good care and see you again inshallah in the next lecture till then take care and allah hafiz